All right. Good morning, everyone. Looks like it's uh, 10 a.m. We have a uh, pretty filled hour. We're going to try to keep this to about 45 minutes and about 15 minutes for uh, Q&A. Uh, my name is Josh Peters. I'm with Ponton Industries. We're, I'm the Los Angeles Territory Sales Manager. Uh, today, we have Mark Lee with Siemens Process Instrumentation presenting the second part of our Hydrangea training. Uh, this will be a more in-depth, advanced training uh, of ultrasonic technology and the Hydrangea. Uh, before we start, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, everybody, everybody is muted upon entry. If you do have any questions, use that uh, Q&A button that is on the uh, left side of your screen. Type your question. I'll be monitoring it, and we'll try to get to everybody's question here at the end. Uh, if we do not have the, if we don't get to your question, I'll have our uh, our account manager, your account manager, reach out to you directly with um, some answers. Um, lastly, if uh, or second to last, if anyone has uh, would like some personal training or more in-depth training at your site, please reach out to us. We can set that up. Um, you can reach me here at Pond Industries. Uh, and then, lastly, if anybody is collecting uh, personal de development hours PD PDHs, uh, please reach out to us, and we can get you a certificate uh, for this training. So uh, with that, Mark, go for it. Take it. Yeah, no problem. Is my audio okay? It sounds like you were a little bit chunky there, uh, Josh. I'm not sure. Yeah, if you that's sound on good. My end. I'm not sure if that was on my end or your end, and probably one. You sound fine. Okay. Well, that's a little scary. So, uh, good morning for everybody here on the West Coast. I think that's probably most of the people on the call. I recognize uh, quite a number of the names on the attendee list. Um, if I've never met you before, uh, I'll introduce myself in just a moment, but everybody always knows that uh, whenever I start a presentation, I always start with a safety minute. So if you'll indulge me on that, uh, I'm going to do a safety minute and I'm going to I'm going to break with national tradition because I'm going to do a safety minute that is not related to COVID-19. I think we're all COVID-19 out on that. So uh, it is summertime. Uh, these are a couple of photos I took in uh, my travels all over the United States. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially if you're out of your normal uh, territory, I live up in the Pacific Northwest, more on that later. But, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have black widow spiders up here. And I was uh, down in Arizona uh, working with a hydrangea application inside of a uh, pump house, you know, a concrete block pump house. And we're looking at an enclosure and I take a couple steps back and, you know, to look above the, uh, uh, the enclosure and the channel partner sales guy that was with me reaches out, grabs me by the arm, screams at me because I didn't see it, but I'm backing up into this Black Widow's uh, spider uh, web. Uh, you know, he's from the area. He recognized it. I, you know, I walked in. I didn't even see it and really was walking right into the landmine. And so, you know, I'd encourage you, keep your eyes open. Uh, those things will sneak up and bite you, so to speak, uh, whether it's snakes or uh, uh, the tarantula we saw just north of uh, uh, San Diego one time. Uh, I pointed that out, that out to the local site folks. I said, is that what I think it is over there? And they go, oh, yeah, that's Bob or Herman. They had a name for him, but, uh, you know, they're used to him being there. I'm not. So, you know, be aware. Keep your head on a swivel because uh, the snakes and critters and, and bugs will jump out and bite you. I guess now we have to worry about murder hornets here in the Pacific Northwest. Eh, whatever. Um, but, you know, it's summertime. Critters are out and about. Uh, keep it safe. So uh, where are we going to go today? We've got all uh, packed in, and uh, Josh and I talked about this yesterday, and it's like, well, what can we take out? Because there's a lot, a lot of stuff we're going to cover over the next 56 minutes here. And, uh, you know, hopefully give you an idea of some of the uh, deep applications uh, that we can do or some of the deep tuning, if you will. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the National Consultants team in just a moment. Uh, we'll talk about uh, all different types of ways to measure level, you know, level, level. How do I how do I measure these? Let me count the ways. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. We'll set kind of basic foundation of some basic uh, level theory of operation just to kind of set a foundation for where we move for. Uh, then we'll get into start to get into a little deeper, get into the echo profile, uh, the response rate, probably one of the most misunderstood parameters in the in the bunch. Uh, we'll take a look at the Hydrangea 200 HMI, kind of some changes there and how that can help you with uh, diagnostics and tuning. Uh, echo algorithms, uh, everybody remembers the famous character ALF. Well, that's not the ALF we're talking about here, but uh, we'll dig into what that really means uh, for our water 
uh, and specifically the wastewater folks for lift stations, uh, wall clean reduction. It's a pretty simple algorithm to apply, but uh, often overlooked. Something called backup level override. Where do we use that? And then I've got a couple to wrap us up today, a couple of some real world examples. So some echo profiles, problems that are commonly found in the field, and we'll talk about uh, ways to solve that. So uh, audio is still good moving forward or, and we just see the, the one screen, is that right? Right. Josh? You're good. Okay, yep. cool. So um, I have the pleasure of uh, living in the Pacific Northwest, as I uh, said a minute ago. I'm a little south of Seattle, Washington, a little north of Portland, Oregon. And uh, I have the pleasure of being the manager or the coach of something we call the National Technical Consultants Team. So this is a team of application engineers that are product and industry experts uh, spread out through the country, uh, be it Houston or Atlanta, Tampa, uh, Philadelphia, Chicago. And what you'll find across this whole team is we have industry experts on all 19 of the Siemens products, uh, instrumentation products, but we also have pro uh, industry experts, whether it's water, wastewater, or chemical, or oil and gas, or uh, food and beverage, pharmaceutical power. Uh, we've got experts in uh, virtually all of those different industries. So if I don't know, uh, I can always use a New York term, hey, I know a guy, right? Um, and so, you know, there's folks that I can reach out to. Anybody on this call is welcome to reach out to any of these folks directly uh, if they like. Uh, I would uh, uh, suggest reach out to your local Ponton resource. Uh, they have a lot of knowledge uh, uh, in-house, but uh, they can reach out to us uh, as needed as well. But we are a, a free resource. Uh, we work basically on the pre-sales technical consulting. So we're oftentimes working on how do I, I'm thinking about what do you have that, our process does this, we'd like to do that. Um, we do have a whole nother channel that is designed specifically for post-sales technical support. And there's a 1-800 number on that coming up here in, in just a little bit. So, but generally we're looking at applications on the front end of, you know, how can we make that application sing? What changes can we make to it to uh, you know, improve the process? As I mentioned, uh, we have 19 different products within uh, instrumentation. So I really call this the eyes and ears of the process. Uh, everything from flow, magnetic, clamp-on, Coriolis, vortex meters. Uh, we're not gonna go into those today, right down the middle, pressure, temperature, pneumatic valve position. We do dynamic weighing, but really where we're gonna focus today is all things level. Uh, virtually everything that we talk about today with respect to ultrasonic translates directly into our radar uh, products as well. Uh, we're gonna be focusing specifically on uh, acoustic or ultrasonic applications today, but what you'll find is uh, in our radar, pro radar products, we basically have the same engine under the hood. Uh, just the mechanical part of making the measurement is different. It's electromagnetic as opposed, uh, as opposed to acoustical, but once that signal gets up into the controller, how you handle the echo is exactly the same. So with that, let's uh, talk about level in general. Um, hey, how do I measure the, let me count the ways. Uh, anybody that wants to grab a marker and start marking up their screen, there's actually 13 different ways represented to measure level, whether it's solids or liquids on this, on this slide. Uh, we're gonna concentrate on the non-contacting technologies today, ultrasonic and by extension radar, but there's uh, several contacting uh, uh, technologies such as capacitance, guided wave radar, hydrostatic pressure. Uh, you can put, as you see over here on the far right-hand side, you can actually put load cells underneath a vessel and measure level that way if you like. So a lot of different ways. The key takeaway of this is which one's the best? And the answer is yes, it depends. The, the key takeaway is your application will define which of these 13 ways is the best way to uh, make the measurement. Not, I've got this new whiz bang shiny thing and I'm trying to shoehorn it in everywhere I can find. Okay, we find a lot of people doing that and you know, as technology changes, a lot of people go, oh, this is brand new, this is your, you know, this is your solution for X, right? Well, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And so really when we're looking at a level application, we're looking from the ground up. What are you, what are you doing? What are you measuring? What's the material? Is it liquid, a slurry or a solid? Uh, what are the, you know, what are the environment? What kind of tank configurations do you have? There is no one size fits all solution. That's why there's 13 of them. And so really the way that we look at this, if you get nothing else out of today, 
you, the application will drive what technology you use, not the other way around. I get this technology and I want to shoehorn it in. All right. So since we're talking about ultrasonics, what is the key advantage? Why would we use ultrasonics to begin with? They've been around for a long time, about 40 years, uh, you'll find. Uh, the one key thing about ultrasonics is if accuracy is your primary driver, and this is where it comes into open channel flow measurement, for example, uh, ultrasonics are still the most accurate level technology out there. Uh, comparing to radar, ultrasonics are typically three to five times more accurate. Okay. Now, if you've got a, uh, a lift station like we have uh, uh, pictured here and you come up to 10 feet, turn the pump on, go down to two feet, turn the pump off, eh, if you're plus or minus a couple inches, who cares? Close enough, right? Accuracy isn't really super important in that application. Uh, up in Idaho recently, we were looking at a uh, open channel flow. It was a six foot wide rectangular weir. A quarter inch of difference in measurement made a difference of 250,000 gallons or 0.25 MGD that was overreported or underreported to the state DEQ. Okay, in that case, accuracy is the key driver there. The thing about ultrasonic is it's not a technology thing, it's a physics thing. The long wavelengths of the acoustical waves, so it's gonna be in the kilohertz range, actually will give you a more accurate measurement, if that's your primary driver, over the really short wavelength of something that's in the gigahertz range, such as a radar, okay? And so, yeah, if you take the best, best radar and the worst, worst ultrasonic, you know, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna flip that curve. But generally speaking, ultrasonic is a more accurate, uh, 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 product to use. That's why it's still around. Okay. They're pretty easy to set up. Um, you can actually get some other data out of it, such as if the transducer goes submerged. Uh, ultrasonic by nature is kind of self-cleaning uh, insofar as that the, the face of it is active like a speaker. So sometimes you can flick, uh, you can literally flick off condensation or uh, moisture off of the, uh, uh, off of the face of it. Uh, ultrasonic tends to be a little bit faster in the measurement. Uh, the fastest, fastest technology is guided wave radar. But uh, so, you know, the speed of the application, how quickly does it fill and empty can be, uh, um, uh, can be a factor. Uh, you can have local control or backup to a PLC or the PLC can be local or it can be the primary control and you can have a backup local control uh, with ultrasonics. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Just in the USA alone, there's over two or 300,000 hydrorangers uh, in use in the United States right now. Uh, we'll talk a lot about sonic intelligence and echo processing. That's really the crux of what we're doing today. Uh, we've been doing ultrasonics for 40 years. Um, the hydroranger family has been around for about 30 of those 40 years, and you'll see some generations of that coming up. But, uh, you know, we know what we're talking about. Um, but let's set a foundation here for just kind of how ultrasonics works. Works on a, a, a principle of time of flight. It's going to emit a pulse. It's going to measure the time that it takes to go reflect off some surface and come back. And it's the old uh, fourth grade or fifth grade math, right? Uh, rate times time equals distance. The rate is the speed of sound. The time is measured. And from there, it can calculate a distance. If you know the distance to the material, you can figure out what is the level in the tank. If you know, in this case, the bottom of your tank is 50 feet and you measure a distance to 30 feet, then, hey, you can figure out there's 20 feet of material uh, in, the, uh, in the tank. The key takeaway here is this. Um, if you're having a problem with level and your level is off by a little bit, make sure that you have the right uh, distance programmed in as to what empty is on the tank. If that 50 isn't actually 50 and it's 48, it's going to throw off your level measurement, which is a calculated. The other thing that I've found, and this is a uh, tip and trick for the people working um, actually diagnosing or troubleshooting. When I'm doing troubleshooting, I like to put the instrument in distance mode, not level mode. And the reason for that is this. In distance mode, I can go out there and if my instrument in distance mode says 13.5 feet, I can grab a measuring tape and I can measure down to my material and see, yeah, that's 13 feet, six inches. Okay, I know that my instrument is measuring the right distance. Okay, it's pretty easy to, to visually check. If you're in level mode, you have to check several different things. Um, the one caution I would give you though, is if you're doing it in distance mode, or you know, if you're switching back and forth between level and distance mode, if the instrument is acting weird, take a step back, take a deep breath, 
ask yourself the question, am I in distance mode or am I in level mode? Because it happens to all of us, myself included, I'm thinking in my mind the instrument's in level mode and it's in distance mode or vice versa, and I'm getting really nonsensical information. Um, that one can jump up and bite you. And uh, I would contend that if anybody on the call here uh, makes a mistake in the field that I haven't personally made already, you have accomplished something pretty special because I, uh, I have fallen into that trap uh, a number of times. So if it's acting weird, take a step back and ask yourself the question, am I in distance, am I in level mode? Okay, so when it's making this measurement, there's a lot of things that happen under the uh, behind the scenes. Number one is it's going to send out the pulse. You're going to get a re return signal. Then the instrument is going to form something called the echo profile. If you've never seen this before, basically it's a visual example of what the uh, uh, what the instrument sees. Now, in this case, um, in this case, by the way, can you see my mouse on here, Josh? Is my mouse or is yeah. my pointer working over here? Okay. So as we're looking down the page here, or our vertical, uh, our vertical axis here is actually showing distance from the face of the transducer going down, and moving to the right is showing magnitude or intensity. So here at the zero level, I have a ring down to the noise floor, and at some distance, I get a big echo off of the material. Uh, we're going to take this uh, this echo profile and rotate it 90 degrees. Uh, some people like to look at it this way just simply because it's uh, it's kind of showing visually down the page is like down the tank. Okay. So after it forms the echo profile, step number four is it's going to apply some filtering. There's a narrow echo in a in a uh, uh, spike filter that we're going to talk about in a couple slides here. Then it's going to apply something called the TVT, a time varying threshold is what that is, and that red line is basically uh, helping to filter out some of the noise, as you'll see down here at the noise floor. Uh, but the key takeaway is anything that is to the right or above this uh, TVT line could be considered a valid echo. Uh, if we were in a live class, I'd ask the class, how many valid echoes do we have in this case? The answer should be one, because we only have one thing sticking up above it. Um, then it's going to go and apply something called echo algorithms. We have a couple slides coming up talking about that here in a little bit. And then finally, it's going to make the selection for the echo. Uh, the instrument is going to go through these seven steps each and every time it makes a measurement. Okay, that's important. Sometimes that measurement is several times a second. Sometimes it's several seconds between measurements, just depending on the instrument and the type of application that you're at. The key thing here is this TVT or this time varying threshold is calculated each and every time it makes a measurement. As opposed to some of the other instruments out there that have like a fixed signal reference line, what the uh, Siemens instrument will do is it will recalculate that TVT and always try and optimize to changing process conditions. That could be agitation, um, it could be some uh, agitation or some bubbling or kind of just a, a just a, uh, a you know a dust or foam or something that's interfering with the signal that will degrade the signal so what the process is or what the instruments always trying to do is to optimize that tvt to stay locked on to what it believes the uh, echo to be and so as a result of that it's going to be um following something where maybe the echo degrades and it adjusts the tvt T down to catch it, and then it, as the signal gets stronger, it's going to adjust that TVT uh, uh, back up. So that's something that is uh, key or different in the Siemens instruments is the fact that that signal reference line or our TVT or time varying threshold is calculated each and every time. Okay. Something else that we do is called uh, multi-shot or sampling, and this kind of happens behind the hood. So what it what it does is it will take a whole number of measurements. Uh, that number of measurements typically by factor default is about 20. Okay. And it's going to apply something called a Kalman filter or a Kalman algorithm. Uh, for the math geeks in the room, that is a mathematically recursive algorithm that looks at the most recent echo. And then it'll give a little bit less weighting to the next most recent and a little bit less weighting to the next most recent and so on. And what that does is Noise by its very nature is random, as you see here across the noise floor. But the one thing that's pretty consistent among all of these different echoes is the actual echo itself. So what it's going to do is it's going to take those and apply this Kalman algorithm or a Kalman filter, if you will, um, and basically try and optimize that performance based on a number of different uh, uh, measurements in order to uh, get you the cleanest signal that it can. 
Okay, you can adjust that number uh, if you want. The challenge is if you increase the number of shots, you can actually slow the process down a little bit because you have to do all of the mathematical calculations in the background. Um, generally, factory defaults, in fact, I can't think of a time that we've actually even made a change to that number of shots, but that is happening behind the scenes and you know you can get a faster response by tuning that back down. Okay, another thing we talked about filtering. Uh, we were talking about a spike and a narrow L, uh, echo filter. I've seen spikes from anything from bolts of lightning to um, big uh, uh, motor starters kicking on where you get kind of a flyback um, effect or an electrical spike, if you will. The spike filter is exactly that. Uh, in the old uh, Hydrarranger speak, that's parameter 821. In the new uh, Hydrarranger HMI, it's called spike filter. Okay, uh, You have the option of turning it off or on, uh, by factory default, it is on to take out those really uh, uh, short transient spikes out of the echo. There's another thing that you have some control over. Uh, the factory default on this is zero, but it is the narrow echo filter. And the narrow echo filter basically allows you to adjust a uh, signal length in milliseconds to allow you to uh, basically chop out some of the narrow uh, some of the narrow echoes. If you notice in this application, how many valid echoes do I have here before I applied the filter? I actually had four. One, two, three, four here. When I applied the narrow echo filter, what you can see is that it will actually truncate or chop off the, the top uh, of uh, some of those narrow echoes, and now you're left with only one uh, valid echo in the system because these others have fallen below the TVT. You got to be a little careful for the water guys, especially when you use the narrow echo filter insofar as water typically gives you a very na narrow echo to begin with. And if you're not careful, you can actually uh, uh, you can actually uh, uh, take out the very signal that you are trying to measure. And so, you know, be don't be real aggressive with that, especially if you're measuring uh, water or some liquids. OK. Uh, probably the most misunderstood parameter within the Hydra Ranger, multi ranger family and uh, subsequent radar is something uh, which is called response rate, or uh, in old uh, Hydra Ranger speak, it's parameter P003. And what this does is this is setting the width of something called an echo lock window. Now, the echo lock window doesn't actually show up. I've kind of put one on here uh, just to kind of show what it's doing. doesn't actually show up in the uh, echo profile, but I'll give you an idea what it does. Okay, um, In that parameter, you have a choice of slow, medium, fast. If this is an example of a slow uh, response, here's an echo lock window for a medium, and here's an echo lock window for fast. So what it's doing is it's opening up this window. And basically what it does is this. It says, I've got a valid echo. I'm going to make another measurement. If my measurement falls within that echo lock window, so here's my slow, then fine, I'm going to go ahead and use that echo right now. If it falls outside of that echo, it will actually wait until that echo has been there for five consecutive measurements before it starts to react to it or treat it as a true echo. Okay. Uh, anybody ever use... Uh, uh, a, a level instrument where you have an agitator blade uh, in the uh, in the vessel. I've seen this used in sometimes in clarifiers as well. What is the chances that that agitator blade happens to be right underneath uh, your ultrasonic or your radar at the exact moment that it takes a measurement? Yeah, maybe not this time around, maybe not next time around, but Murphy's Law says at some point it's going to be there. So if it's looking at your process and all of a sudden it sees a step change, it sees a, uh, it sees an agitator blade, it's going to go, huh, I see a new echo, but it's outside of my echo lock window. So I'm not going to react to it right away. I'm going to wait. And then by the time it takes its next measurement, that agitator blade is moved out of the way and it goes, ah, okay, never mind. I'll stay stuck on this. Uh, if you set this thing to fast and you open this filter up, it's going to say, Oh, I see something new. It's inside the window. I'm going there right now. One of the things you'll find on the whole uh, Hydra Ranger, Multi Ranger, is if you walk up to the display and you have a pretty static, uh, you have a pretty static uh, process at that point, and all of a sudden you're looking at a level and it's it's like 8.0, and all of a sudden it goes 8.2, 7.9, 8.1, 7.8, 8. .8, 8. 
uh, 8.0 and it's kind of sitting there not real stable in the measurement even though your tank is stable that's a pretty good indication that you have that echo lock window turned or opened up way too wide by default the pro uh, the uh, this particular parameter p003 or response uh, response rate is actually set at medium Sometimes when people, you know, you have a contractor comes in, they go to set it up, they don't know what it what it means when they set it up, and they go, oh, fast, fast is always more better. Let's make fast. Well, when you set it to fast, you open up that window, and as a result of doing that, uh, you basically can cause your system to be a little bit unstable, even in a stable condition. Um, if you go and look at our book on parameter P003, it doesn't do a great job of explaining really what's going on there but it is talking about the rate of change. So if you have a process that's changing very, very quickly, you do have to open up that echo lock window for something that is moving, uh, you know, 10 feet per minute, for example, in your uh, tank level change. Then you'd have to go to a fast. Uh, a slow is plus or minus about four inches per minute. Medium is about three feet per minute. Fast is anything greater than three feet per minute, okay? Um, as I mentioned, the Hydra Ranger has gone through a lot of changes. Uh, they've been around for a little over 30 years, and you can see the old Hydra Ranger Pluses. There's still a gazillion of those out there, still kicking. Uh, then we went to the uh, Hydra Ranger, and now to the Hydra Ranger HMI. Okay, the HMI is the latest uh, and greatest one. Uh, as you look under the hood, really, it's the same Hydra Ranger you know and love. They did make it finger safe, and the thing I like is the terminal blocks are removable. Okay, if you have big fat fingers like mine and you've ever tried to terminate a transducer in uh, terminals uh, three, four, and five, it can get a little tricky. You can pull the terminal block out, terminate it out in the air, and then snap it back in. The other thing you'll notice on the header, there's a, a little header here and a couple of standoffs. You can actually pop in communication cards. So if you want to do uh, Ethernet TCP IP or Modbus TCP, or uh, you know, Profinet or some of the advanced communications, uh, you can just snap in a communication card right into that thing and away you go. The other nice thing is the form factor is still the same. So if you have an old unit and it's all plumbed in and uh, you wanna just uh, upgrade it, but you don't wanna take the box off the wall, guess what? Four screws, you can take the uh, circuit board out, take the door off, slap on the new door, the new circuit board fits in in exactly the same place, and voila, you have a, you've upgraded in the field. Uh, one caution with that is that the serial number on the board set no longer matches the serial number that's on the nameplate on the top of it. But if this thing's been sitting out in the California sunshine for uh, five years, guess what? You can't read that. You can't read the label on the outside anyway. So, but just be aware that you would have a serial number mismatch between the outside and the inside, but really su super simple to uh, migrate from the old technology to the new, okay? Display screen isn't a whole lot different than what you had before, uh, showing your, your level and the status of the relays and whatnot, but what is different is with the four buttons and the display, pressing the right-hand button will send you into uh, will set you into a number of wizards, uh, quick start level, uh, volume or flow, and basically it'll walk you through in English. So you don't have to use the handheld programmer and uh, you basically just answer a number of questions and you don't have to pull out the, uh, you don't have to pull out the, uh, the manual or the Siemens decoder ring to know uh, what is the code number for an XPS 15 transducer to uh, enter into parameter P004. Okay. The other nice thing is uh, on this is there's a quick start or a wizard for setting up the relays. If you've ever set up a relay or relays with a handheld on the Hydra Ranger, um, guess what? I can't even do it without the book. Uh, setting up the relays is really, really super simple. It basically asks you, do you want to set up a relay? Yes. Which relay would you like to do? Relay number two. What do you want relay number two to be? Uh, high level. Okay. When do you want it to come on? at 10 feet. When do you want it to go off? Nine feet. Okay, done. Would you like to set up another relay? No, I'm done. And it basically walks you through a set of questions like that. A uh, really, really, uh, real nice upgrade to set up the uh, the relays uh, if you've ever done it the uh, with the old ones. Now we get into the, uh, to the uh, diagnostics part of it. You can actually get that echo profile directly on the on the display screen. That is a huge upgrade because it used to be you could only get to the uh, uh, to the echo profile using software such as PDM. By the way, the new units still work with PDM, so if you you know and love that, you still can use it. But now you can get a little 
a little tiny representation as to here is that echo profile. And in this case, it is rotated 90 degrees. So distance is going to the right and magnitude or intensity is going to the left, or excuse me, going in the vertical direction up. Um, I'd ask the, the class, how many valid echoes do we have in this case? Because here you see your TVT. The answer is there are two valid echoes that the system will consider uh, in this case. We're gonna talk about uh, the remainder of the time today really manipulating uh, the TVT. However, we're about 30 minutes into this. So, you know, it's time for a, a momentary break. So everybody take a deep breath. Um, Josh, I'm gonna ask if you could check the queue and see if there's any relevant questions maybe that we could answer on what we've covered so far. As we're taking a quick break, uh, I'm gonna pop up a uh, picture standing next to my barbecue on my deck here in Washington. You can see uh, straight to the east here is Mount St. Helens and uh, off to the uh, northeast uh, is the tip of Mount Rainier. If I were to take this picture and rotate it uh, a little bit to the south, uh, about the south, same distance to the southeast, we have the uh, uh, tip of Mount Hood, which is the highest point in Oregon, Mount Rainier, the highest point in Washington. And just behind Mount St. Helens is Mount Adams. You can't see it in this picture, but uh, uh, yes, from my barbecue, I look out at four active volcanoes. So Josh, any questions that came in? Well, I take a quick breath here. Yeah, yeah I've got, I got one for you. Um, so on the primary influent grit removal rakes, uh, so rigs are used. Can we can you negate the signal of the rigs you're using measuring uh, and just measure the influent waste using a hydranger? Um, Josh, I'm, I'm sorry, you're pixelating really bad. I couldn't understand what you said. I'm sorry. So for uh, uh, primary influent uh, grit removal, uh, when the rakes are used, can you negate the signal of the rakes so you are just measuring the influent waste? Um, so if you, if you've got, if you're doing grit removal on, pri uh, on the primary input, can you, and I didn't hear the rest of them, sorry. I want to help in real quick. Uh, let's see, if, let's see if, it, if this works. Can you hear me okay? Um, no, you're Mark? pixelating really bad. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it must be your sound. Um, yeah. Let, let, let's see, let's see if this works. And by the way, if anybody has any sound issues, uh, I don't want to have the presenter do this, but on the left-hand side, there is a, a phone uh, icon, which you can switch to phone. And when you do that, it will, that will change to coming out loud and clear for me. Okay. Yeah, just some users, uh, if you have any sound issues, you can click on the phone icon. And as it switches to phone, that same icon will switch into computer audio. So you can switch back and forward, and that should fix it. Okay, so um, let's, uh, I'll tell you what, let's uh, move on. We'll come back to that question a little bit, see if we can maybe get the sound cleaned up a little bit later. I'm still coming over to clear on your end, though. Are we, uh, is it still clear, yeah, clear. what you guys are? Okay. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna jump on because we've got, uh, yeah, 27 minutes left and got a, had to take a little, little break here, but, uh, you know, throw in a little personal bit, but let's, uh, let's charge on down the road here. Let me, uh, all of a sudden my, uh, my PowerPoint disappeared. Here we go. Okay, so let's talk about what about the the world of uh, when you don't have one single echo, right? Here's a case where I've got a uh, echo profile. I've got three echoes: echo one, two, and three. There is something in process intelligence which is talking about how it evaluates these different echoes, and it evaluates them on three different values: area, large, uh, the largeness, and the firstness. If I can make up words, and what it's going to do is it's going to apply a numerical score to all of the valid echoes based on three criteria. Number one is what is the area underneath the curve between the peak and the TVT. So you can see here an area. Uh, echo number one doesn't have a very big score. Echo number two, even though it's a little bit shorter, is fatter, so it has more area. And then echo number three uh, is pretty close in area to number two, but a little bit smaller. Okay, It's going to look at the largest. So obviously, number three is the largest, then echo two, next most largest, and echo one, and the scores represent that. And then we look at firstness. Uh, you know, echo one is the most firstest. Uh, echo number two, to make up a... Uh, Word is the next most firstest, and echo number three is the uh, uh, the least firstest, if you will, and those scores represent. Then it's going to take a sum total of those, and total score wins. 
So in this case, uh, if it has, if it's presented with these three echoes, and a, and is looking at all three of those parameters, echo number two is going to be the one that it selects because it it does have a slightly higher score by virtue of the uh, uh, the area. It has a, a slightly higher score than echo number three. Well, what do you do if uh, uh, what do you do if echo number three, that distance of uh, 50 meters in this case, is uh, your echo? Okay, you can actually adjust parameter P number 820 or in the new Hydrangea HMI, it's called algorithm, right? You can use just area, just largest, just first, area and largest, area first, largest first, and then you can use best of largest and first, best of largest, best of first, or true first, okay? And so you can adjust that parameter to try and uh, pick the one. In this case, maybe we might choose largest, right? Because largest is my is my true echo, and then it would basically uh, the one that has the highest score and largest. In this case, that would be echo number three. Would be the one that it selects. Um, I do uh, caution sometimes in using the single algorithm, such as area or largest or first. Sometimes that can give you a little bit uh, uh, unpredictable results. In this case, uh, it would give us exactly what we want. But be a little careful if you're only using one parameter. Because if you're going largest and all of a sudden you have a bolt of lightning and you get this really, you have a spike filter turned off and you get a really high magnitude, uh, short duration spike, or maybe you kick on a motor starter and you have a real, uh, you have a real sharp uh, uh, electrical spike in there, uh, it'll jump to that echo if you have the spike filter turned off and you have only largest uh, chosen. So, and being that echo would disappear, it would go back to echo number three, but it can cause some instability in the system. So this is one that, uh, like I said, you can manipulate with this algorithm. Uh, just remember that based on the parameters that you choose, total score wins. So uh, you don't, uh, you're not going to have a way to look at uh, the granularity as to what score it's giving to those. Uh, it's basically just going to tell you which, uh, uh, you know, it's going to use your parameters and then select the one. And you don't get to see this. This happens in the background. There is no way you can look at this. When you're talking echo confidence, what you will find is the echo confidence in this case is going to be zero. Actually, it's negative 58, but we don't show negative numbers because echo confidence is going to be the echo it's selected minus the score of any other echoes that you have. So you would have 105 minus 102 minus 61 basically is going to give you a zero. Okay, so sometimes you can have a relatively low confidence number and still a real healthy system because it is selecting the right echo. But if you have multiple echoes, it tends to drive down that confidence number. So you have to use that number kind of with a grain of salt sometimes. That one will sneak up and bite you as well. Um, I know we'll have questions on this one, but uh, let's move on and uh, uh, pop out a couple more of these things here in the time that we have left. There's something that's called wall cling reduction. Uh, this is specifically for the wastewater guys. That's where we see it most often. Uh, parameter number 136 uh, is one that you would use, or guess what? Uh, it's called wall cling reduction in the in the uh, uh, Hydrangea HMI. Basically, what you do there is you're going to randomize the set point. So let's say your pump comes on to 10 feet, okay? And if it always goes up to 10 feet and then always pumps down to the same point, eventually you get kind of a grease ring or you get a buildup right there on the side of your wet well. Okay, when you use wall cling reduction, what you do is you're going to give it a range and I'm just going to pick a number at, at random and I'm going to say uh, enter in a value of a foot and a half and enable wall cling reduction. And what it will do is it will randomize the set point between eight and a half and 10 feet. So it'll come up to 8.9 feet, turn the pump on and go back down. It'll come up to 9.8 feet and then uh, pump back down. The next time it might go 8.1 or 8.6 feet and then go back down. So you can set the width of this band so that the process doesn't always come to exactly the same point and then pump back down. That reduces maintenance. Uh, uh, that reduces maintenance in the system. And like I said, most of the time we see that in uh, uh, wastewater applications. There's something else that's called backup level override or BLO. And what BLO allows you to do is to put in a point level switch 
Uh, typically, this is going to be a high high or a low low switch. And what you can say is, if that if that point level switch is ever activated, you can then drive the output, the current output of the instrument to whatever value you define. So you could say, if your transducer fails and it gets to trigger that high high point, it can send 21 or 22.5 milliamps to the output or 20 milliamps, if that's what you define, to the output of the instrument. And it will do, uh, it'll, uh, do that so then you know oop i'm at a high high turn on all the pumps turn off all the pumps shut the valve open the valve whatever needs to happen in your control system but this backup level override is kind of a point level uh, uh safety uh, system that you can then drive the output to whatever you define maybe you want to drive it to a low if you uh, hit a particular uh, a point you know it depends on really what your control scheme is um there is another parameter in there that you can adjust the time delay on that so if it trips that switch wait five seconds and then it and then do it so you can take out kind of some transients if you have maybe waves that splash in there or something like that um let's talk about a couple of real world examples here um i like to tell this story because i was uh this is one that i uh, ran into particularly um i'll give you the background here i was uh driving up interstate five i was in about central oregon and driving up interstate five toward my home and i get this phone call from uh, Vancouver, Washington, just north of Portland on the Washington side. And they said, hey, we got this system. It works good most of the time, but every once in a while, this thing will jump to a high level and it will stay there. And it'll stay there for either a long while or stay there till we go and we cycle power on the system. And then it'll go back and it'll work great for a while. And then every once in a while, it'll jump back to high. And I said, you know, it's um, okay. And I said, I'm going to be actually driving by here there in about an hour and a half can i you know can we swing in and can we go meet at the site yeah so uh, about an hour and a half later i'm at the site with uh uh their guy and i said um you know let's take a look at this and pulled out my laptop we hooked up pdm and i got this copy of the echo profile and so this is the system as we found it and um so again if we had everybody live in the room i'd say how many valid echoes do we have and the answer is three. So I've got I've got one here. By the way, this is in meters. So at about seven feet down, I got one echo. And then I got another echo, not quite as big, exactly 10 feet later. And then there's another third echo that's down 25-ish feet down, which is the true echo of the material. Now, one thing I forgot to tell in the story is that the XPS 15 transducer happened to be in a stilling well. Okay. Um, as soon as I saw this echo profile, I went, aha, I know exactly what's going on. And I say to the guy, I said, you got a tape measure in your pickup truck? Yeah. I said, go get the tape measure and let's open up the wet well, take a look. The key is seven feet down, I got an echo off of something. I'm in a stilling well. Exactly 10 feet later, here's another echo. What comes in 10 foot sticks? PVC pipe with bell ends. So guess what? Here's an echo. Sure enough, we open up the wet well, seven feet down. Here's an echo off of that first bell end coupling of the two pipes put together. And then exactly 10 feet later, here's another coupling that it sees. And then finally it sees, um, finally it sees the echo off of the material. Now that echo algorithm that we were talking about earlier was set at best of largest and first. Okay. So which is the largest echo here? This one. Uh, this one, the third one, the true material echo, which is the largest echo? Yeah, that one. Which is the most firstest? This one. Remember, total score wins, right? So most of the time, they had a real nice echo off of this process. But every once in a while, something happened. There was some agitation or something. And the largeness of this echo decreased just a little bit or just enough that the firstness of this echo took over. And so it went, oh, this is my echo now. And a echo that's a short distance away means what? You're stuck at high level. And it would stay locked onto that high level until either the process improved and we got a strong enough echo off of the material, or if they cycled power, when you cycle power, you kind of reset that filter and it would go back in, take a fresh look at it, and it would go, oh, okay, there's my echo down there. So I went, 
perfect. I know exactly what we're going to do. And we did something that's called auto false echo suppression. And what auto false echo suppression does is it allows you to manipulate this TVT curve. It's three steps. Uh, you'll see a slide here. They actually make it four steps, but it's, it's really three. What you do is you put the, the process in its lowest level, which it was, and then you subtract about a foot from that, foot, foot and a half. So let's assume this was down here at 25 feet. What we did is we said, okay, we're gonna enter a distance of 23 and a half feet. Step number one, enter a distance. Step number two is we're gonna tell the instrument to learn to that distance, learn where all of these noise obstructions are, learn where those bell, bell end couplings are. And then step number three is we're gonna go in and enable or tell it what uh, to use what you learned. Some instruments in the portfolio will automatically do step number three. I always say, you know what, if you go and enable something that's already enabled, it stays enabled, that's good. Um, that way I don't have to remember which instruments you have to enable, which ones you don't. But we did that. We entered 23 and a half feet, went in, told, told it to learn, took about three or four seconds for it to do that, and enabled the, uh, enabled the new TVT and voila. So what it did is the process went and it mapped around uh, the bell end, it mapped around the other bell end, and then how many valid echoes do I have left? One, problem solved. Okay, now, usually somebody really smart in the room says, hey, but wait a sec, Mark, as this thing fills up, this echo is gonna migrate to the left. Yep, so when you're down at 10 feet, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be here just a little bit more than three meters. Well, what happens when this echo gets inside of this zone that it's mapped out? Well, there's the beauty in the, in the instrument itself. Uh, when you're looking at uh, auto false echo suppression, it doesn't just learn where these echoes are, but it learns the signature of those echoes. And the signature off of, in this case, a bell end, or maybe you have an open tank and you have a cross member or rail or, or a weld seam on the side of a tank or something like that, the echo off of a steel pipe is different than the echo off of the material. So it learns what you're trying to measure and it learns where these things are. And so if this echo happens to migrate here to the left and it happens to stop right there uh, where you've mapped that out, it will remember or it will still follow your true echo because the signature of this one and the signature of what it mapped out are different. That is something that is unique to Siemens as part of that process intelligence. Okay. so. If we go to the, uh, you know, how do you do it slide, here's the official slide of how to do it. Here we've got a, a well, or we've got a pipe sticking out there. We got a return off and uh, off of uh, both the pipe and the, uh, the material. We apply some filtering, we do a TVT. I've got two valid echoes. We're gonna apply ALCO algorithms and voila, it selected the wrong echo. So then you go through and we'll run auto false echo suppression. You can do it with the handheld, somatic PDM. Some of the units you can do it from the push buttons. Uh, Pactware, AMS Suite have the ability to do that. Uh, you can use Internet Explorer with the uh, LUT400 series. So you can do it a couple different ways, but you apply auto false echo suppression. So you basically uh, figure out what distance you want to learn to, learn to that distance, perform a learn function, and apply it, and voila, you have one uh, one valid echo left. This is a really, really powerful tool and can uh, uh, can really help you with the, uh, uh, you know, in some of those where you don't have a perfect thing. I've seen uh, concrete seams on the side of a, a tank or a vessel uh, cause an echo and you can map it out using auto false echo suppression. Okay. So a lot of different, uh, you know, a lot of different ways that you can uh, uh, deal with that, either through algorithms or auto false echo suppression. All right. Um, how about one more real world example? And then we'll, uh, we'll kind of wrap it up and, and take some questions here. So uh, last real world example, this happens all the time. Um, this happened uh, up in Idaho. Had a customer, they're having some trouble where their complaint was that the system worked great at first install, worked for about six months, really great, and now they were getting erratic and unpredictable measurements. Sometimes working with the echo profiles, um, it's kind of like reading the tea leaves. You have to, to kind of see a few of them and kind of get an understanding. 
One of the things I do suggest to folks all the time, if you're calling tech support, uh, if you can get a picture, uh, cell phones are a wonderful thing, get a picture of that echo profile off of the display screen or if you have PDM, uh, capture it as a JPEG image, use a snipping tool or something like that. If you send that in uh, to tech support and they can see what the process is doing, usually that's going to give you a quick indication. Um, this system had been in operation a little more than six months and they were having some challenges with it. And I looked at this echo profile and what you note is it doesn't really ring down to the noise floor. It kind of takes a long time for this thing to ring down before uh, it gets down to the noise floor and finally you get this echo. And I looked at this and I said, okay, um, where is the transducer cable spliced? And they said, Oh, no, it's not spliced. It's continuous. I said, no, I'm looking at the cable coming into the box. I said, that's not my cable. And I know the transducer has a cable coming out of it. Somewhere it's spliced. And they said, um, well, how do you know it's spliced? I said, well, it's not the same cable. And number two, I can tell by looking at the echo profile, you've got this thing spliced and I'm going to bet you used wire nuts. This happened to be a wastewater application. And, they, and so we start, we go back to the transducer and we trace back from the transducer and a couple of LB condolettes later, pulled the cover off. Well, uh, there is your three yellow wire nuts. And I went, ah, here's the problem. Pull the three yellow wire nuts off, cleaned up the connections and tightened them back and came back and boom, look at the difference. And I'll toggle back and forth between the two. You see how this thing rings down to the noise floor and stays down at the noise floor? Okay. Whereas with the uh, wire nuts, it's actually creating a long ring down time. Okay. That's one of those that just a little bit of experience and working with it, you know, you'll start to see these kind of things. What effectively is happening is wire nuts are really a bad splice for the transducer cable. Because especially in wastewater, you have a little bit of H2S gas. What does H2S do to electrical connections? It actually creates a, uh, a little bit of resistance. Resistance equals a voltage drop. A little bit of voltage drop is going to take the transducer, or excuse me, take the instrument a long time to figure out because it's trying to figure out what's happening with this voltage drop for the signal coming back. So cleaning up those connections, uh, basically, uh, uh, basically, uh, changed it where it was doing ringing down to the noise floor. One of the things you'll notice, though, is that the TVT curve still remained the same as it was before. So in other words, they had done a learn for auto false echo suppression in an attempt to fix this, and it remembered that learned uh, TVT. So guess what? We went in, did a auto false echo suppression again, and once we did that, now all of a sudden you got a nice clean system and problem solved. And that was, uh, well, that was actually back in 2015 that we pulled this out. I uh, haven't heard from uh, that site since. So what I did suggest to them is take out the yellow wire nuts, solder those connections together. And uh, uh, from there, we can, uh, uh, you know, get a good, clean electrical connection there. If you use wire nuts, it's not, uh, if it's going to fail, it's going to be when it's going to fail. And typically in wastewater, you're going to get, you know, six months, maybe a year out of it till you get enough resistance in that wire nut connection before you start to have problems. So that's one of those, um, you know, if you can get a copy of the, uh, the TVT, if you can use PDM and get a copy of all your parameters and the way that it's programmed, that really, really helps the, the folks in tech support, uh, uh, to help the folks in tech support if, to try and diagnose your problems. So um, that takes us kind of to the end of what I wanted to uh, talk about today. I'm going to jump here. Uh, here's my uh, contact information for anybody on the phone. If you want to snap a picture of that or, uh, you know, the millennials in the room pull out their iPhone, take a picture. Uh, you know, I still use a good old fashioned pen and pa uh, pen and paper. That works too. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, and, uh, you know, recognize with the uh, Ponton folks, uh, a lot of them are very, very well trained and, uh, you know, know this stuff. Uh, I would say Josh knows uh, this stuff pretty much as well as I do. And, uh, you know, he's been trained by the best. Wink, wink, nod, nod, Josh. So um, with that, um, I'd say let's uh, take a look at the questions. Maybe I can, uh, is there a way I can view that question queue on my end, Josh? If, yeah, if you uh, just click on the QA button on your left side, it should come up with all the oh, questions. Oh, there it is. For you. Okay. 
All right. Do you want to uh, do you want to address any of them? I you've probably been monitoring them as they're coming in. Uh, do you want to uh, answer any so far? And I'll just read through them real quick here. Um, so there's one here for the response rate. Um, are there different timing intervals between slow, medium, fast, or do they all take five shots before transmitting the number? Um, they do. You can vary the number of shots. Uh, the timing interval is exactly the same, and it's going to be based on the type of uh, system that you have. If you're using long shots and short shots, regardless if you use uh, uh, the slow, medium, fast, it is going to uh, take five shots. Uh, you do have some control, but I would, I would suggest probably not messing with the number of long shots and short shots and the duration of the pulses uh, manually, uh, unless you unless there's something pretty special in the system where you need to uh, let the, you know, let the system kind of do, uh, do its magic. And very rarely do we have to override those, those factory setups on that. Okay. Another one. Um, how does the gigahertz range differ from the kilohertz range um, in the measuring process? Boy, I am having a hard time. How does the what range in the, the gigahertz range differ from the, kilohertz range uh, in the measuring process how do they differ oh yeah so um so if you're looking at the electromagnetic spectrum okay kilohertz uh typically the human ear you can hear from about 20 hertz through about 20 kilohertz or about 20,000 uh cycles per second that's about the upper range uh some high-end musicians can hear to like 22 kilohertz uh, the ultrasonics are typically up in dog whistle range. They're up in the 36 kilohertz, 44 kilohertz range. So outside of the range that you can actually hear, okay. And gigahertz, I mean, now, you, um, you know, uh, your frequency is much, much higher. Uh, and so it's no longer in the you know, ultrasonic or just outside of the, just outside of the acoustical range of what you can hear, but it's actually up in the electromagnetic uh, range up in the, uh, you know, the microwave radar range. And so um, the frequency, that's kind of, if you want to go back and refer to the uh, webinar that we did, which is selecting the right radar antenna, we actually cover those different frequency bands uh, in uh, that webinar uh, is spent a fair amount of time just talking about the different frequency ranges and where they're best or optimized for. Um, so let me read this question again. How does the gigahertz range differ from the kilohertz range in the measuring process? I believe it was said that the kilohertz is ultrasonic and the gigahertz is radar. Yeah. Um, so yeah, ultrasonic by its very definition is going to be a sonic or an acoustical pulse, uh, albeit it's going to be outside of what you can hear with your uh, uh, with your physical ear, but uh, it's up there dog whistle range. You'll drive all the dogs in the neighborhood crazy, but uh, it's you know it's just slightly out of the acoustical range we can hear. Gigahertz is up in the microwave or you know the microwave or uh, uh, you know up in the radio frequency range, uh, which obviously you can't hear with that. So. In, uh, in regards to BLO, can we use it as a low low? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the example actually showed uh, showed a high high. That's a lot of times where it's used, but you can use it for a low low as well. So you can say if your ultrasonic loses signal down at the bottom for one, re or one reason or another, um, you can actually have a point level switch down there and say, if I get to this low low range, um, uh, you know, send a uh, milliamp uh, value of three or four or three and a half or four uh, uh, to the control system. And that would presumably put, shut off, use to shut off the pump so you, you don't run the pumps dry and uh, cavitate them. So absolutely can be used as a low, low or a high, high. You're basically going to enable that function. And then what you're going to say is if that point level switch it's looking for a contact closure. If that contact closure happens, then do this. Uh, in the case of a low low, typically you're going to shut the pumps off. You don't want to run them dry. Uh, can be used absolutely in exactly that application. Perfect. All right. 
what can you uh, do for condensation buildup on the face of a transducer that's causing erratic reading? <laughs> Love that question. Who wrote that question? <laughs> uh, send that send that guy a gold star. Beautiful. I, I see the name here. I don't want to rat him out. But uh, yeah, condensation. What can you do about condensation on the face of a instrument causing erratic level readings? In the case of ultrasonic, because it is an active face, uh, there is a un published uh, field modification that you can make, which is you can uh, put some, you can sometimes put material on the face of the uh, transducer, such as Rain-X works really well. Um, I've seen car wax used. And what does Rain-X and car wax do? It actually kind of beads up the, the water. Okay. Uh, there's actually a YouTube video we could point you to where we're using a spray bottle with a transducer that has a rain X on the face of it. And what you'll see is that it's, it's physically flicking the water as the face is flexing. As you're spraying it with the spray bottle, it's flicking the water right off the face of the transducer. And so using uh, rain X or car wax, uh, something like that uh, on the face of it, you can use that to, uh, you know, cause the condensation to beat up. And so it makes it a little easier for it to, the face of it to flick right off. Um, I did have somebody tell me one time that tobacco juice, you know, a, you know, you know, spit some tobacco juice on that on the face of the transducer would work. Um, never tried that. Uh, he was a good old boy from the South. He was from Arkansas. And uh, he says, yeah, you know, spitting tobacco juice on there will work. Well, um, okay. Um, I thought about it later, though. That guy wasn't on the wastewater side. He was actually in the drinking water side. So I'm going, mm, okay. I uh, might not recommend that, but sometimes you can put something on the face of the transducer to allow that or to help that uh, material beat up. Great question. Um, there's a question. Is there a way to enter a custom table for a flume or a weir not built into the hydrangea? Absolutely. Um, outside the scope of what we talked about here today, uh, I would say just reach out to uh, uh, your uh, uh, Ponton uh uh, your Ponton representative, and there is a way that you can create custom flow tables. Very simple to do, um, and there's a couple different ways to approach that. Uh, Josh, I might suggest uh, maybe doing another webinar series. Uh, we could do open channel monitoring, uh, where I have a 45-minute uh, 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 webinar that we could do specifically, and it addresses that question directly. I think that would be a great one maybe to do in the future. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, can I use a Siemens radar as a sensor connected to an ultrasonic Siemens controller, such as a uh, uh, Hydra Ranger, to utilize the alarm relays on the controller? Absolutely. Um, I'm actually uh, testing one out right now, and I can say uh, uh, I've got our new LR100 series connected up as a milliamp input into the Hydra Ranger as a uh, milliamp input and I set that up as input number two and I have an XPS 15 transducer on input number one and guess what that creates a redundant controller using two technologies ultrasonic and radar in one controller and you can then uh, trigger uh, utilize the relays either as alarm relays or pump control relays the same as you would for any transducer and now you have a redundant controller that has both ultrasonic and radar in the same box, controlling the same process, sitting right next to each other. It's a it's a beautiful solution. And I actually have one sitting uh, about 15 feet away from where I'm sitting right now. And I've been testing that out and it works beautifully. So great, you know, boy, there, there's, another, there's another gold star. Uh, question, is an XPS 15 transducer class one div one? Yes, it can be ordered as uh, either explosion proof or as a, a general purpose. So uh, it depends on uh, how it's ordered. But yeah, the XPS 15 is available um, in both uh, explosion proof or non-explosion proof, depending on the parameters at the time of order. You do still have to um, deal with the uh, seal off and so far as the transducer would go in your classified environment, the controller, the Hydra Ranger box is, there is not an option for that to be in a, a class one div one environment. So the controller would sit in a non-classified area. The transducer is classified and then you would have to have the appropriate wiring for the seal off to keep your gases from migrating from your classified area to your non-classified, but frequently done. 
uh, what would be the band of gigahertz that you would uh, want to use to measure the level on an anaerobic digester with thick foam? Uh, excellent question. Uh, I would recommend a radar in the 6 gigahertz range, such as our LR200, which is optimized specifically for uh, anaerobic digesters. Uh, again, I would refer to the recording of the Selecting the Right Radar Antenna uh, webinar we did. Uh, how long did, ago did we do that, Josh? A month ago? Two months ago, maybe? Probably two or three months ago, correct. Yeah, it's been just within the last few months, uh, certainly since the COVID-19 lockdown. And we talk about that exact application, but uh, short answer, 6 gigahertz LR200 is optimized specifically for anaerobic digester foam applications. Um, oh, somebody uh, says they're using vacuum grease, uh, and that works great. I'm assuming that was a uh, response to what you put on the face of a transducer. Uh Uh, how do you ignore exposed agitator blades when the level is low and causes signal distortion sends a uh, high signal? Um, on that, you can, uh, in the example I used, you could make sure that you have the right uh, setting on your parameter P003 or response rate. Uh, we might want to talk uh, about that application specifically because uh, there's a couple other things maybe we could apply there, but uh, I might suggest... Uh, you know, we take that one offline, but usually with agitators, we can use that parameter P003 to, uh, to deal with that. Uh, uh, can ultrasonic work for tanks applications holding material in which, which creates some vapor due to high ambient temperatures? Um, maybe. Uh, typically, if you have changing vapor uh, uh, conditions inside of a tank or a vessel, um, changing vapors typically will change the speed of sound. And if you change the speed of sound, you can actually have inaccuracies. Um, again, we'd probably want to look at that uh, application specifically and what is the material and what is the vapor and whatnot. A lot of times that's a case where radar uh, actually works a little bit better because it's not affected by the change in vapor space. And so... Uh, sometimes in those liquid applications, a liquid level radar uh, might work, uh, might be a superior solution to ultrasonic in that application. Again, we'd probably want to look at the, uh, the particulars of that one, but as a general rule, if you have a changer, changing vapor space and it changes the speed of sound, the instrument doesn't know that. It just knows I sent out a pulse. How long did it take to come back? And if your process is changing, that that speed of sound is changing, uh, you'll be chasing the... Uh, the calibration of that all over the place. Uh, will Vaseline interfere with the ultrasonic? Might be a little bit thick. Uh, I've never tried it. Um, I would say maybe a thin layer would be okay. If you get it on there kind of thick, it, it could, uh, uh, you don't want anything that would impede the, uh, that would impede the uh, operation of the transducer. Um, could work. I don't know. I've never actually tried it. Um, these next two are about uh, class one div one next best fifteen f. Yeah, uh, seal off only or conduit con con attached to it. Um, that of course is really that's really going to be a, a matter of national electric code as to what the requirements are between your uh, uh, between your classified and unclassified environment. Probably want to talk about the particulars of that one uh, offline. I'd say reach out to uh, Ponton and, you know, let's let's look at that specific, especially when we're dealing with explosion proof. Generic answers um, can sometimes get you into a little bit of trouble, and we want to be sure we're understanding enough about the process that we don't uh, uh, give a wrong answer there. But generally speaking, there's going to be a seal off to, uh, based on NEC uh, regulations as far as, uh, you know, how do you separate between the two environments? Are all of the relays the same or are they different? Um, there's some uh, 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 single pole, single throw, and there's single pole, double throw, or it, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, single pole, double throw. So you can have normally open, normally closed. There is a combination of both. Uh, they're not all the same. And let's see, I'm going to go back up to the top here. Okay, here's the question that I was having a hard time understanding. Let me read it real quick here. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, I work in the wastewater industry or uh, in wastewater on the primary influent grit removal rakes are used or on the primary influent grit removal rakes are used. Can you negate the signal of the rakes so that you're just measuring the influent waste? Um, it sounds like, um, uh, it sounds like maybe in that application, you have the transducers a little bit too close to the rakes and you might want to relocate them. Probably want to talk about that one again, if we have some drawings or some pictures of the application or even a, a site visit or something like that. But, uh, you know, because the rakes are moving and depending how they're moving within the field of view of the transducer, that one could be a little tricky. It might be better just to move the transducer a little further upstream so that you, uh, you it's outside of what the rakes are, uh, uh, outside of where the rakes are actually operating. Probably want to look at that particular application. Um Okay, is there a way to tell the system the correct depth? So, for example, you show two echoes, and we know that what the correct depth, do we show 30 feet, but should but should be 30 feet? Can we tell the system 30 feet? Um, generally, if you have two echoes, um, and the correct one in this case is at 30 feet, and the other one is presumably something shorter than that. Sometimes that uh, auto false echo suppression uh, is a uh, is the way to deal with that, assuming the second echo is not moving. You know, what's causing the second echo? Um, probably want to look at what the cause is, and then there's probably about three different ways we could deal with it, either through uh, the algorithms or through the response rate or auto false echo suppression usually would uh, do that. And auto false echo suppression, you basically are telling it, this is the echo I want to use and ignore the other fixed echoes from fixed things that are in my system. Uh, and Mark, um, one last thing. I think I don't think I saw the parameters for auto false echo suppression in the slides. Could you just uh, go over which parameters in the um, older style hydrangea they are? Um, yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to look it up in the book. I um, honestly, I've uh, over the years, I've forgotten. I want to say, it. yeah, I'm not going to guess. Um, if you uh, go to the manual and just go auto false echo suppression and search it, it'll take you right to the uh, parameters. Um, Josh, uh, if you want to just kind of wrap us up, I know we're a little bit over time, but uh, have, having a good time here. Let me see if I can uh, find that real quickly in the manual while you kind of take us home. For for, yeah, for everybody else that's still online, we will uh, follow up with you tomorrow. Uh, we'll send out a recording of the webinar, and then uh, feel free to reach out to us um, if you do need uh, professional um, development hours. Uh, please let us know. We can get you a certificate, and um, we'll go from there. P838? 838, 837. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to enter the range in parameter number 838. You're going to say, how far do you want to learn to? Then go to parameter number 837 and perform a learn function, which on the old Hydro Ranger is you enter a two. Uh, enter the two, wait about three or four seconds. You'll see the uh, display screen kind of flash a little bit. And then uh, go back and make sure that parameter number 837 is set to a one, which is to use what you learned. So parameter number 838 and 837 are the ones that you would use for auto false echo suppression. Great question. And we had two more questions that came in. Okay. So is there a way is there a way to hold hold or pause measurement, for instance, when there's a short term obstruct, obstruction? Um I'll have to scroll down and read it myself. I'm sorry, Josh, I can't really hear what is there yeah. Is there a hold or pause measurement, for instance, where there is a short term obstruction? Ah. I'm going to guess that that short-term instruction might be the uh, might be the sweeper arm in a, uh, a clarifier. Yeah, let's talk about let's talk about that one offline. There's a couple different strategies for how you can um, uh, how you can deal with that if you have a slow-moving uh, sweeper arm coming around on a clarifier. Um, and there's a couple different ways that we can uh, that we can deal with that. So, uh, short answer is: Is there a way? Yes. Uh, let's talk about the application and come up with what is the best way to do it. 
Um, last question I see, uh, actually a couple more popped in here. Uh, what's the minimum measuring distances? Um, there is, it's a function of the transducer. Um, typically speaking on the remote transducers, the XPS uh, 10 and 15, I usually say about a foot. Uh, we do have uh, another unit such as the LU240. Uh, it was pictured in the uh, presentation earlier. Um, the LU240 uh, actually has a distance of a little over eight inches, let's just say eight to nine inches uh, of a blanking distance. So you have to have a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of uh, distance between the face of the transducer and whatever your uh, uh, material that you're measuring. So yeah, there is a minimum. Uh, typically, I'm going to say nine to 12 inches. Uh, you're safe in most cases. Um, it varies based on the transducer that you choose. Um, Uh, can I uh, can I scale screen on the HMI version to reflect elevation versus zero to hundred percent? Absolutely. Um, there is a elevation offset parameter. I want to say it's P six zero two, but there actually is a uh, elevation offset if you want to display in feet above sea level uh, versus a zero to hundred um, percent, and that's just in the scaling. So. Uh, short answer is yes, there is a way to do that. Uh, you could call Ponton or call tech support and they can, they can walk you through that. Uh, and uh, are you powering the radar with the Hydra Ranger? Uh, that can be done with a DC version of the Hydra Ranger. Um, in the case that I was doing it, I was actually using a, uh, a, a remote power supply just so I had good control of the uh, remote loop. So I just have a little... Uh, I just have a little, uh, what do you call it, DIN rail mounted power supply that I was using. Um, if you have the DC version of the uh, Hydra Ranger, then yeah, absolutely, you can just use the DC supply for that and it'll work just fine. So, great questions. All right, I think that's it. Yeah, so, uh, thank I, you, everybody. Looks like I got to the bottom of the list there. So, yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, as always, tell me how I can help. That's, uh, you know, the, the crazy applications, those are kind of the fun ones sometimes. Maybe a little frustrating, but sometimes fun in a really weird kind of way. So. All right. Thanks, Mark. Hey, you got her. Talk to you soon.